Good evening, everyone. I'm Dolly Duffy, the executive director of your Notre Dame Alumni Association, and I have the honor of presenting this year's Reverend Anthony J. Lauk Award. Since 2000, this award for fine arts and visual arts has recognized an alum, living or deceased, for their outstanding accomplishments or achievements as practicing artists. Just saying that line, I feel like I'm like at the Academy Awards, is that what it is? <laughs> One of those award shows where they say those things about what it is. No, nah, I don't think so, <laughs> I, I know better. Um, I have some really prepared remarks, but I'm gonna go off script. I know that those of you who know me are really surprised by that. Um, but this morning I woke up and I thought, wow, I get to introduce Steve McFeely, who is from the class of 1991. And as I said to him, you know, Notre Dame has a lot of lawyers. That's really good. And a lot of doctors and a lot of people who work on Wall Street and a lot of all of it. But you and our other award winners are occupying an incredibly unique place in Notre Dame history for the kind of work that you've done. And I'm incredibly proud to be standing up here for this award to be introducing Steve McFeely. So after graduating from Notre Dame with degrees in English and government and international studies, was that considered a triple major? Okay, just poli sci, thank you. <laughs> Steve went on to earn his master's in writing from UC Davis. He got his big break, my understanding is, in 2004, when alongside his writing partner, Christopher Marcus, he was commissioned to write a television movie adaptation of The Life and Death of Peter Sellers for HBO. The film went on to win nine primetime Emmys. This is not your first award. Even close. Sorry, we have to have this conversation. There's been a drought. Including the outstanding writing for a miniseries movie or special. They went on to work together on the Chronicles of Narnia franchise, which set the stage for their work in the Marvel Cinematic Universe with credits for the Captain America franchise, the Avengers franchise, and the Agent Carter television series. There are so many other credits, I don't want to steal his thunder, but I have to say that um, together Steve and his writing partner are the highest grossing screenwriters of all time. Not all Notre Dame time, of all time. <laughs> With a total gross of 9.3 billion, that's with a B, not an M, in box office receipts. I love the fact that some of you are going, they also currently, yeah, they also currently lay claim to the screenplays for two of the top five grossing films of all time, Avengers Endgame, which is number two on the list, and number five, Avengers Infinity War. I won't steal any more of his thunder. You can tell I'm so proud to be head of an alumni association who honors people like Steve, Marlene, Anna Maria. So, friends, fans, please welcome Steve McFeely. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you. Um, hold on a second. Uh, I, if I get a little misty, you'll forgive me. Um, my father died a year ago this week, and he would have gotten a big kick out of this. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. I enjoy speaking about myself about, <laughs> about as much as I like flying or snow or um, wearing a suit. Uh, <laughs> As you can tell, I just have the one. Uh, uh, so, so thank you for this. Uh, uh, first, I would like to um, thank the Alumni Association. It's, I, I am honored. Uh, I'd like to thank 
uh, Tom and Brian for nominating me in the first place. Uh, it is a tremendous honor to receive the Lauk Award as a practicing artist, uh, despite the fact that I don't really think of myself as one. Uh, artist always felt like a label that someone else would put on you and not something I could claim for myself. Uh, my wife Jennifer rides me about that. She would rather I just own it, but it's, um, artist was not the career I was destined for. Uh, it turns out I just like writing. Uh, and I guess I was okay at it. In high school back in San Francisco, I got attaboys for essays on the Canterbury Tales and Catcher in the Rye. Um, but writing certainly was not a career. A career was being a lawyer like my dad uh, and his dad, uh, who, by the way, I, I hadn't, I should mention this, my grandfather um, uh, dropped out of Notre Dame in 1929 because he couldn't afford it anymore. Um, and he was in a band. We have a banner on our wall, you know, a national championship banner. Um, remember what those used to look like? Um, uh, and, uh, and he dropped out and went and became a Capitol policeman for a while back in D.C. and then saved enough money to go to Georgetown Law because at that point you didn't need a bachelor's degree to go to law school. So it's a big family um, success story, and now I am uh, one of three generations, Brendan here being the third, uh, to go to Notre Dame. I digress. Um, uh, a career was being a lawyer like them. A career was wearing one of these. A career was a commute. Uh, it was a briefcase, and it was a tank ray on the rocks with a twist at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> And if I'm honest, I wasn't really looking forward to that. I think in the back of my mind, and I know I get this from my mom who's sitting right here, um, I think I thought there must be something more, not artistic, but creative or fun that I could do with my life. Um, but we were a practical family and attorney at law is what I was headed for until here until this place, until Notre Dame in the spring of 1989. Um, when in Hagger Hall, off in the hinterlands near the North Dining Hall, I don't think you people know where it is. It's, um, I took an American Studies class. Uh, now I am sure it is very different today, respectfully, but I was an English major and American Studies was kind of a vacation. Um, <laughs> There were about 15 kids. Greg, it was me, it was Michelle Gams, and it was the defensive line. Um, <laughs> and the course was a uh, survey of literature of the American West. Uh, and we read some books about colonization and black bears and the Big Rock Candy Mountain. Um, but it, it wasn't the teachers that changed everything for me that spring. It, was, it wasn't the books, it was the teacher. And that teacher was Barry Lopez, class of 66. Barry was a visiting professor, uh, but more importantly, he was a writer, a working, honest to God, in the flesh writer. Uh, on Monday, I could go to the library and pull his, one of his many books off the shelf and see his name on the cover. And on Tuesday, there he was, standing in front of me in cowboy boots and a little skinny uh, crochet tie, as was the fashion in the day. Right? Um, <laughs> I had never seen one of these in the wild. Uh, it, it, it was, it was life-changing. He spoke softly and read lots of books and thought big thoughts and took an interest in me, probably because of my interest in him. Uh, he lived in mysterious Oregon. Uh, he wore blue jeans every day and had a commute to nowhere. And once I met him, there was zero chance I was ever taking the bar exam. I had other English classes of note that were important to me. Um, Percival Everett was patient with some truly terrible short stories I wrote my senior year. Uh, and the late Dennis Moran was kind to me in two classes, the last of which was a children's literature course, uh, which included the study of books like Wind in the Willows and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, now all of that kind of makes it sound like the die was cast in the spring of 1989, and I was going to be a writer, but it sure didn't feel like that. Um, it's not like meeting a writer means you get to be one. 
I just saw Brady Quinn in the elevator. Doesn't mean I get to be handsome, you know? I mean, it's, um, so after graduating, dead middle of the class, <laughs> I went home to California and did what most frustrators do, frustrated writers do, I think, I taught, uh, specifically English at my old high school. And that was great, and I learned a lot, mostly about sort of organizing and reading the book before you teach it. Um, <laughs> But the bug was still there. The idea of writing was still there. And so after a couple of years, I took out a bunch of loans and went to UC Davis to get a master's degree in creative writing. And the degree was almost beside the point. Uh, the point was to try to write before I had a wife and a kids and a mortgage. Grad school was just a chance to try and likely fail and get it out of my system. And in the process, several things happened. Uh, I got a little better. I developed a system for outlining and writing and rewriting that I use to this day. Importantly, I met my writing partner, Chris Marcus, with whom I shared an irreverent attitude and an aversion to getting a real job. Uh, and that Christmas, my uncle gave me a book called How to Sell Your Story to Hollywood. This had never occurred to me. I don't know what these words even mean. Um, uh, I liked movies. Movies were sort of the spine of my childhood. I can quote you Raiders of the Lost Ark, Alien, Star Trek II, The Empire Strikes Back, you know, as if they were uh, canon in the Bible. But it had never occurred to me that someone writes those. Um, but the more Chris and I thought about it, the more it, A, seemed like a long shot, B, was no more long shot than getting your novel published, and C was sure better than starving to death. And so Chris and I decided to write together, and we wrote a thriller while we were still in grad school, which was far from thrilling. Um, <laughs> we argued over commas and linking verbs and all that kind of stuff, but the process went well enough for us to make a deal with each other, uh, that we would move to Los Angeles with no contacts and very few resources, and we would give ourselves four years. Uh, four years for something to happen. So if on my 30th birthday, if we were nowhere with no prospects, we were going to shake hands and go on with our lives and get those wives and kids and jobs and mortgages that we were so desperately afraid of. Uh, so we worked a lot, writing and rewriting and watching movies going to our crappy day jobs. Mine was at Nickelodeon, licking stamps for the 1996 Christmas card, amongst other things. <laughs> I had a master's degree, for God's sakes. <laughs> um, uh, and eventually, though, that deadline, that self-imposed deadline, that fear led to a pretty decent script. And then some good luck led to an agent, and then some bad luck led to another agent, and then a movie for HBO, as Dolly said, about the life of the actor Peter Sellers. And that went on to earn awards and it absolutely constituted our first break. Um, and suddenly I was writing for a living. But there are plenty of people who make it to Hollywood and get that break and stall out. I have been blessed to forge a career. And that career only really came in 2003 when our agent called and said, hey, Disney's making a movie out of a book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> and so needless to say, we got that job because I was going to get that job. <laughs> and that introduced me to blockbuster filmmaking, sort of on a, on a, on a big scale, uh, which is how I forged my real career. Uh, and that career, blessedly, gratefully, has taken me around the world. And I've made movies in New Zealand, and Prague, and Atlanta many times, and London. And that career has put me in nice trailers with Robert Downey Jr. and on set with Scarlett Johansson. And it's allowed me to talk pasta with Stanley Tucci, and <laughs> politics with Don Cheadle, and baseball with Robert Redford. <laughs> he likes Lou Boudreau. Um, that career has meant that every Halloween, I get a little choked up when the doorbell rings. <coughs> and a little six-year-old Captain America screams trick-or-treat in my face. Come on. 
Um, it's allowed me to start a company with my friends where we get to pick our own projects, one of which is Wind in the Willows. Um, that career has allowed me to work every day creating something with creative people, writers and directors and actors and cameramen and costumers and production designers. So with all due respect to the lawyers in the room, <laughs> Notre Dame spared me the law and likely spared all of you a crappy lawyer. <laughs> um, Notre Dame allowed me to live a creative life, which it turns out was the thing I was looking for, Bob. <laughs> uh, and I can't imagine a greater gift. Um, so I am indebted to this place. I am indebted to Notre Dame, which is why I try to take a little bit of it with me wherever I go. <laughs> Um, thank you, whoa, thank you very much for this, I appreciate it, it's a, it's a tremendous honor.